Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends and I have here with today with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh. And you guys, I hope I am coming to you crisp and clear and beautiful because I have a new microphone. Okay. She's very beautiful. Very, very powerful. We love her. Welcome, Koneko. You are never here first on a Saturday. Rare Saturday first. I just got home from vacation and I'm absolutely exhausted from the road trip. Well, that makes sense. No horsies if you're exhausted from vacation. You you will have to later tell me all about your vacation. I would yes. love to hear about it. Um, I know you told me a little bit while you were there, but I, I'd love to hear now that you're back. Um, so yeah, that being said, though, uh, Landon, what are we talking about today? our final fandom stream for the hunger games we just read uh the ballad of songbirds and snakes last week and now we are diving into a conversation about what happens when creators and authors and owners of certain media continue the story beyond what originally was the hit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh the dangerous path of of continuing and not knowing when to quit so <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about yes okay so the dangers of continuing the story um we're gonna go into it so just to make sure that you guys are aware there's gonna be one more hunger games episode in december yes. when uh the ballad of songbirds and stakes movie is released but this is probably our last fandom episode unless that movie like super inspire something for us there will only be one more hunger games episode and then we'll be moving on to something else next year more about that in a moment um we're very excited but uh but that's what we're doing for today the dangers of continuing the story um i feel like the past decade has just been a constant series of groaning at saying oh another remake sequel reboot Wow. Oh. How do you feel in general, Landon? I feel very unenthused. Um, there is <laughs> I I think it is a consequence of capitalism. Mm. We want a guarantee. Uh, the big money networks want a guarantee, and so they're going to look at their catalogs and go, what made money before? And if that made money, then we're going to we're going to support that. We know that it works and we're going to support it and we're going to shove it down people's throats because people that never get tired of seeing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, do they? Never. No. Mm -mm. Never. No. I want to be spoon-fed the same franchises I loved when I was 12 years old for literally forever. Yes. Please. And that TV shows, movies, books, it's all the same. Uh, those mega corporations, you know, they're part of the system. They have a lot of people working for them. They have a lot of people that they've promised a lot of money to. They need to make sure that they can follow through on those promises. And they're, they're going to be as lazy as possible about it. Because anything uh, risky means that the bills might not get paid. Exactly. And... Unfortunately, that means that creativity in some, in the major works of all of these major industries uh, is dead. Art is dead. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's like, okay, um, we are currently in what um, we believe in the future will be called the late stage capitalism, okay? We are currently in the Roman Empire version of today's economy, where everything has reached this kind of like zenith of stability. We don't know if it'll last for a long time or not. We have no idea. But we're kind of like, we're kind of, we're, we're in the sameness, okay? We're in the sameness of late stage capitalism and organizations that are large, once they have reached a certain um, a certain uh, amount of money that they make on the regular, they become very risk averse. Basically, that's what's happening. Um, Koneko laughs in Warrior Cats, which literally introduced magic for two arcs and then dropped it, never to be seen again. Warrior Cats is a great example, Koneko, which I only am familiar with through the zeitgeist. So we will not be talking about it today. However, I think it is a fantastic example of what we are discussing. I just don't know enough about it to speak intelligently. And I think you're the same, Landon. We were never Warrior Cats kids. We were never Warrior yeah, Cats. Yeah, so I don't know about yeah. that one. But yeah. When I understand of the zeitgeist, yes, you've got it. You've got it. But which ones are we talking about? We're going to go through several, um, but what are we starting with? We're starting with our old faithful 
the fandom that we were raised in, the fandom mm-hmm. that we have discussed over and over and over again, and are too, like most of you, tired of hearing about it. But here we go once again. Uh, Harry Potter and the need to continue, the need to continue to stay relevant. Uh, I think that there is something important here uh, to add into this is not only J.K. Rowling's ego is influencing this, uh, but there are not just a publishing company and a film industry company depending on this, but Universal Studios as a uh, franchise and as a uh, theme park is also dependent on Harry Potter. So you have three major areas and major companies controlling the need to have this stay in the forefront of our mind. Uh, thus, the ridiculousness that we have on the screen. Yes, that face, that face was for Rar in the chat. You're here. Oh my God. I, she, Hello. Rar has been watching so many of the VODs instead of coming to the stream and, and lamenting to me that they really wish they could be here in the stream. So I'm so happy to see you here today, friend. I'm so happy. Um, But yes, okay. So yeah, Harry Potter. Oh my God. Every time I think we're going to stop talking about Harry Potter, we don't stop talking about Harry Potter. The the never-ending Potter. It's never going to end. It's never going to end. Oh, my God. And and, and here's (sighs) the part of me. The the child in me still loves it. So I still love to talk about it. But at the same time, I'm tired of talking about it. I keep thinking. In terms of everything else. I keep thinking someday there's going to be no more to say about Harry Potter. And I keep being wrong over and over and over. (laughs) We don't talk no. about Harry. No, no, no. <laughs> we talk about Harry too much. Uh, actually, that's the opposite of that song. Uh- <laughs> okay, but the reason we're talking about it so much is because Harry Potter continues to fight tooth and nail to stay relevant yeah. when it is completely unnecessary. J.K. Rowling, you have enough money. You have enough money even to meet all of your ridiculous political ambitions that I hate. That's the truth. And so it pains me extra that to see like not only the studio like this is universal studios problem but it is also jk rowling's problem and that's not right that's not right here's the deal first fuck turks so i this is not to support jk rowling that i'm saying this but i genuinely do not think that this is a jkr thing i think this this is an industry thing I don't Mm -hmm. think J.K. Rowling is pushing for Harry Potter Hogwarts Legacy. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's pushing for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact originally she wasn't pushing for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. That's true. Like, she, I don't think, outside of the seven book series, pushed for anything. She washed her hands of it, wanted to become a mystery writer, wanted to be loved and adored for her own works rather than for this fandom niche thing that she wrote failed and i honestly think that if the company is like left her to her own devices she would be perfectly content in her cultish following thinking that she has spiraled into uh that's and she would have more and she would have because it's not like it's not like the paycheck hitting her bank account changes anything Mm. it's not like the love and adoration that comes from any of this is like a net positive to her she's already surrounded by yes people true so i i personally believe that this is a money grab for all the other industries that harry potter has that has built their world around harry potter warner brothers studios irrelevant think of a movie that they've actually produced that has had anywhere near harry potter there isn't in the anything. Last decade. There isn't anything. This is their golden child. This is their ticket. This, this is so what sells. They, they need to continue to have the money flowing, so they're going to continue to sell it. Mm. And then, of course, we have we have Universal Studios, which has built three Harry Potter theme parks. The theme parks are good, by the way. <laughs> Just by so the way, good. for what it's worth. <laughs> and the butterbeer is fantastic. And oh my god. Merch, great uh i'm not saying go out and buy it because fuck turfs but also at the same time if you do happen to go there it's very good Mm -hmm. uh but they have thousands of employees and also universal studios was a non-compete against disney and now it rivals disney in some ways because of harry potter and all of a sudden the generation of people who go to theme parks it's growing up and you either have yeah, and a, and a lot of the millennials that are having kids have to choose between, like, do I afford a ticket 
to go to Disney, which my kid is very connected to because Disney continues to produce stuff? Or do I go to Harry Potter, which is nostalgic for me, but might not connect to my kid unless they continue to create new Harry Potter things? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Alpha Tiff, I spent way too much money on Butterbeer Mood, girl mood. So good. Same. <laughs> I, uh, I love the Butterbeer at the parks. Honestly, I still have dreams about it. Um, I, I would like. If- I don't. I don't know what they put into it. I it's need crack. to know because it's so good. It oh my really god, is. crack! It's literally like it's like crack and ecstasy ground up and mixed together or something. I don't even with I sugar. Can't. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sugar. It's just sugar. Um, catch the full vault on YouTube. Yes, yes, yes. Tickles my writing brain, but now I'm too tired. Okay, I understand. Koneko, go rest. You had a lovely vacation. Um, and you can tell me all about it later. But yes, please go rest. Please go rest. Okay, so. Here's the deal. Why I think that your analysis here, Landon, could clearly be spot on. And I think there's this push and pull within JK Rowling, but here's the evidence. Um, She wrote those mystery novels and she seems to think that they're good. Okay. And they do sell a decent amount of copies, um, but not that many, not as many as she should be selling with the name recognition she has. When everyone knows that Robert Galbraith is her, okay, there's no, this isn't a real pseudonym, you know, not she, that she, situation. And she doesn't write under, she doesn't even write under that name no. anymore. She's that, but she's back to J.K. Rowling. Yeah. So like, okay. So like she writes these, no one really likes them. They still sell decently. It's not like she's going back to youth literature or to young adult literature. She has no plans to do so. And she has stated multiple times that she will never go back to writing youth literature or young adult literature. The closest thing she would ever do is like companion pieces to Harry Potter, right? That's it. Like there's nothing else. And I believe her when she says that. I think she's telling the truth. I think that um, she wants adult fans. She wants an adult fandom. Unfortunately, she did get that but they're turfs. So, (laughs) so, you know, I think basically you are correct. And I, but I think that there's a little bit of a push and pull there because I think like she's happy to help them continue Harry Potter. And if they weren't continuing Harry Potter, I think that she would put more into it because that's what makes her money. And the money allows her to achieve the political goals that she has because she's very active in the UK with her political messaging. I... I am not, so I am not up to date on JKR's finances, just putting that out there. But I feel like that after she hit the billion dollar mark, she's got to be making more money on interest alone than she is bringing on in Harry Potter, which must be able to fund her political ventures. I see what you're saying. Like she, she probably has um, an accountant or like a finance person who has it invested so she can live off of the interest and push her politics off of the interest. I, yeah, I don't even think, I think she is to the level of rich where money isn't even a concept anymore. She is. She, that's definitely she, true. She just can wave her hand and can be like, I want to give a million dollars to this thing. And it doesn't even mm-hmm. blink of an eye. Money is like a collection. She's got enough money where money is like a collection to her now. Like money, she treats money like gum, like people treat like their Funko Pops or something. Right. So, I, I think that it's more ego it, at that point. Like if mm. currency isn't currency, what is currency? Mm-hmm, and the mm-hmm. thing that you can never get rid of is ego, right? That's that's how we think of ourselves, where we feel our status is within the zeitgeist. Yeah. And we know that, that power kind of affects the ego in the same way that like literal brain damage, like getting in a car crash affects it. We yes. know this. That's been studied. So I think that it's all about her connection to this is less about the money and more about that she wants to make sure she has control over the story. So I, yeah, she's, I would agree with that's that. That's why she's like, I don't I don't actually believe that she was on the Fantastic Beats writing committee. <laughs> I don't I don't think she was in any writer's room with Fantastic Beasts and where to find them or any of them. I think that she wanted to because she was a final say and a final script. Maybe mm-hmm. a part of the brainstorming story, but I don't think she wrote a single fucking line of dialogue. I don't think she did any of that. Do I have any proof of that? No, but realistically, <sighs> um, I I think that there is a, I, I think that like she is assigned to all of this because of the control. And maybe if, she if none of this was happening on the side of cursed child legacy fantastic beasts the reboot wasn't happening she might return to harry potter or she might not she probably gets the same ego boost about harry potter stuff as she does with politics stuff i think so that's true mentioned yeah so so, 
Oh, you go, go ahead. Finish your thought. I was just going to say, I don't, I, I, I genuinely don't. I think that she is doing the bare minimum in all of this. She is, she is holding on to grasping control, but she is certainly not actively thinking about it anymore Mm, mm. yeah i think raw has an interesting comment that kind of like um dovetails into this uh she probably have genuine adult fans if she hadn't gone turfy because i imagine there'd be plenty of harry potter fans who would migrate to the mystery just out of loyalty true many did at first when we were in the in the the couple of years where like a bunch of people that were really active on twitter were saying she's a turf she's a turf she's turf and everyone else was going nah 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 nah, just whatever like it's not that serious obviously nobody thinks that now but there was a couple of years where that was happening and i think during that time, there were Harry Potter fans reading her her terrible mystery novels. Um, and then the other comment is, but now she just went turfy and only has fans that want to use her as a figurehead. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's that's basically true. There would be a tiny fandom of, of Potterheads, mostly, for those mystery novels if she hadn't gotten weird and turfy yeah. on Twitter. Uh, or in her novel i mean like yeah. her novels have also become so political yeah. like her new one is about is just complete ableism like there is there has been ableism and racism and, and obviously transphobia in her novels prior to this but this next one this next mystery novel is like in i haven't read too much on, on it but it's like implementing someone who's a wheelchair user like it's it's insane Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh and she uh it's i i think that she would have genuine fans i think that they're i think also like a lot of people have followed her into the turfy world because they felt like they were genuinely fans um but i think that like when you are feeding your ego from online hate and love it doesn't matter what's coming towards you. Attention is attention. Yeah. And that's kind of like where she's stuck at if her behavior online is any indication of that. Mm -hmm. And this is all just another form of attention that she doesn't actively need to do. She just needs to have the words Harry Potter attached to it. True. I think that's, that's basically true. And to kind of bring it back to like the, the franchise itself outside of JK Rowling, like let's think about the past couple of things and why them continuing to push Harry Potter with JK Rowling being um, as politically aggressive as she is like the Fantastic Beast movies, they got really bad. No one liked them. And the, because JK Rowling is how she is and everything that we just discussed, there's no grace for Harry Potter. It has to be amazing or no one's going to like it. Okay. Hogwarts Legacy People actually did like that game that played it. Okay, there was the huge boycott against it, like we know, all that stuff. But people did legitimately like it, but it wasn't any better or worse than any other similar games. It was average. It's exactly what you would expect from this style of video game. You know, this kind of like collectible fest role play element Harry Potter, right? Like, it's exactly what you would have expected. Not bad, but not good either. And the thing is, because J.K. Rowling is how she is, and Warner Brothers is pushing these things how they are, what we have to have for anything Harry Potter to be successful now is for it to be, like, just mind-blowingly amazing. Like, they need to... This remake that's coming out, if it is not top tier every single way... All that's going to happen is people will watch a few episodes and then drop it. That's that's it. That's it. Because that's what happened to the video game. People were into it until the next big thing came along. I mean, I don't think most people even beat this game. There, there's, no, there's no community really around this game. Um, you know, it was just kind of like, oh, this is the, this is the big role play ish game that's out right now. And so that's what everyone, everyone is playing. As soon as the next one but- came out, everyone moved on. But here's the deal. Honestly, that probably makes more money for the people, for the the for the designers of the game, for the company that designed the game because regardless if you play 1 hour or 150 hours, you still bought it for the same price. It's a good they point. They still made the same sales. Yeah. Which means it doesn't matter if it continues to stay relevant for years after it was sold, if it's a bestseller in a viral moment, there's going to be another follow up because it made money. I think for the game that there there will be um yeah. but these other things that are part of Harry Potter's kind of like media universe, they don't operate that way. 
the show I mean, is going to end up being a, a one or two seasons if it operates that way. I I don't know. I it matters. I I think that that is the thing of like it's HBO. True. And HBO has had some really good runs and streaks with shows. I think it depends on how lazy they get. Mm-hmm. versus like if, if it's a cut and paste of the movie especially because here's the here's the biggest problem they're facing beyond the fact that like the fandom has turned against them and it's very black and white and whether this is great or it's going to be terrible if it's anything less than great uh the first movie is so loyal to the book and it's an hour it's two hours mm-hmm how the fuck are you going to make something that was two hours and gold and fantastic and beloved by millions of people last 10 episodes, eight episodes? You're going to have to add like stuff in. You have to add stuff that, in. And people might be like, this is stupid shit that you added in. And it's all going to depend on who the actors are, how well the writing is, yep. how lazy they get. Yep. All of that's going to depend. And the writers of HBO have been successful with it. House of the Dragon is was incredibly successful. Yeah. Uh will I mean obviously it's only one season but people were blown yeah, away by it. Yeah, but it's getting it. a second season, isn't it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they're they're okay, done. I was pretty I sure it wrapped, was. I think they wrapped filming. I think they've approved through 4, I okay. believe. That's what so, I thought. So it, it's gonna like it, it's going it's going to be is this is this going to be lazy writing or not and it will i yeah. think truly there is a chance that it might be great i'm not gonna be happy i'm like why the fuck are we doing this when there right are it's not been so long many enough. better options it's not been long enough that's what i feel like okay so okay so to kind of like bring this to to a, a point i think we should say, say like okay landon are you planning on giving the show a try are you gonna watch it I will most likely watch it. I will too. Okay, so let's be real. Let's be real. We're we're both going to give it a try. Okay, if it's worth watching, we'll watch it. And um and I think that it really hinges on that because people most people that are in the Harry Potter fandom are not necessarily gamers. So the the fact that the game was successful is kind of irrelevant to this this group of people. Their rem- blast rem- memory is the last Fantastic Beast movie and how terrible it was. So that's the taste that's in their mouth when they go into the show. Um, And so, and my expectations are very low and I really don't think we need a remake at this point. It's not been long enough. So yeah. yeah. Um, If it's not amazing, I just don't see myself getting that into it. I don't think we need a remake. I don't think it's been long enough, but I also disagree with you that I think the last, the, 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 taste in people's mouths is going to be fantastic beasts i actually disagree with that because i think fantastic beasts 3 flopped so heavily so many people didn't even see it uh it also came it came at the end of an incredibly traumatic two years in in america culture in american culture it came right at the end of COVID. so like that whole like trauma brain wrapped up two years shit people don't remember what happened in those two years absolutely not uh i also think like this might be the the thing that is smart with the marketing is returning it back to the series uh connects it back to the movies connects it back to the series you don't you when you think of harry potter you don't think of fantastic beasts and where to find them no because it's terrible no yes it's terrible but you don't think of it most people are going to think of the books they're going to think of the movies they're going to forget about fantastic beasts I don't think it's been long enough. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's the smartest move of dumb moves. <laughs> yeah, well, because well, we're saying like we can still just watch the movie. So the idea of redoing the books in a TV show is exhausting, right? Because the movies have aged well. There's nothing explicitly wrong with well. them. That's, they have, that's though. not true. We've done no, no, I am not gonna rewrite history here. We have done enough analysis of fucking Harry Potter and especially the movies of Harry Potter to sit there and be like, absolutely not. Movies four through seven, eight sh- were shit. <laughs> we're shit. I love it when I find the right thing to say and you just trigger that. the fuck out of Landon. It's the funniest <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> Okay, but so... I like to argue, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so first they have to get to book four. 
first they have to get that's, there. <laughs> that's the problem. That's I don't think, and that's the thing is if book if the if one and two are not the most beautiful thing ever, mm -hmm. they won't be able to get to four. Right. Yeah. And that's the that's the thing that they're working against. Yeah. Again, smartest of dumb ideas the smartest it's a dumb, dumb idea but it's the smartest one of them so yeah i ultimately i feel like harry potter is they are in the danger zone they need to oh, yeah. stop making so much harry potter stuff and move on to something else um because at this point i don't see how they can ever recapture that magic and that zeitgeist like i think the moment is passed it is done if they want to reboot harry potter we need another couple of decades truly that's how i feel i think that it should just it, i mean the theme parks are really good but i don't think that we need this stuff i feel like the only reason they're doing it is to make sure they hold on to the intellectual property rights and that there and there's no well, other reason well, and that's, and that's the thing of, like, that's what's forcing this. Mm -hmm. Like, they have to do something mm -hmm. in order to keep the pro intellectual property rights, in order to keep the parks relevant, mm -hmm. in order to keep the, the businesses afloat. Yep. They need to do something. Yeah, because we got to increase shareholder wealth every single quarter or we're dead. Or, or, like, even at some point, like, don't get me wrong, it increases the goal in most of these places. But I don't even think that this is like, I, I think when it comes to Harry Potter, it's not even increase anymore. It's relevancy. Yeah. It's keeping it relevant. It's like, so it's, people it's care. like we have to keep it relevant in order for people to care. Yep. Yep. For sure. So yeah, that's our take on Harry Potter. We think they should stop. Basically, they've milked the cow. It's dry. Nobody wants this anymore. If they lose the IP rights, do they have to close the parks? No, because IP rights for parks versus movies versus books are completely different things. So absolutely not. Because you can have a different rights holder for theme park rights versus movie rights. But in order to sell tickets and, again, compete with, like, Disney, mm -hmm. truly that's who they're competing with. They, yeah, have, yeah. they have LA, they have Tokyo, and they have Florida, all of which have Disney locations. Uh, in order to compete with Disney, they have to stay relevant. And the only thing that they have in their parks is Harry Potter. Yeah. Because no one's going to Universal Studios for Jurassic Park. Yeah, it's true. They're going for Harry Potter. It's the best thing there. So, yeah. Harry Potter, right. please stop. <sighs> they, they won't, but please do. <laughs> yeah. The next, we're going to talk about something that we are talking about, that we've talked about, that we've analyzed on this show. Uh hunger games hunger games uh this is gonna go 180 here hunger games did awesome yeah i uh okay so i was so scared going into ballad of songbirds and snakes so scared that it was gonna be bad and i was so happy to be wrong i liked it i liked it and i wouldn't mind a sequel to ballad of songbirds and snakes i feel like though when it comes to hunger games um, I, I think it needs to stay in this kind of trajectory of like sequels or prequels or things of that nature. Please, you guys do not ruin it by trying to reboot Hunger Games. Okay, we don't need a Hunger Games TV show. We don't need remakes of the movies. Like we don't need any of that. Okay, we just need more of these like sequel prequel type books like Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is, and only if Suzanne Collins feels like she can continue on this uh, trajectory, on this path of um, analyzing her own uh, political views, right? Because that's yeah. where I think Hunger Games is in p the potential danger zone. They could get into the danger zone, where if Suzanne Collins starts to feel like I've said everything I have to say about this political idea. Okay, then stop. Like, once she feels that, I hope she stops because I'm really nervous at the success of this book and if the movie is successful, that it will go into the danger zone like Harry Potter is. I don't think it will go into the danger zone like Harry Potter is because we had such a long rest period. We did. Uh, it was 10 years between publishing Mm -hmm. of Mockingjay and Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. It was, I believe, movie came out in 2012. So it was eight years between the last 
thing of the Hunger Games, the the Mockingjay Part Two movie, and the publishing of Songbirds and Snakes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I think I think that the rest period gave time for the fandom A to grow up, B for it to not be shoved down our throats, and Suzanne Collins to find the story that she wanted to tell, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and maybe along the way had many thoughts of different stories that she wanted to tell, and so I would be okay if they came out faster now because of that rest period Mm -hmm. i do not want a sequel of ballad of songbirds and snakes i don't think there needs to be one we have heard about snow we know snow i don't need to know anything more about snow of his time in office personally i don't think it would help anything we understand how snow got to who he was today by this move by this book what do you Um, want what would you like to see so if they made Hunger Games, what would you want to see? I would see? love to see. I would love to see District Thirteen and how mm. and how they operated. I would love to see uh, some stories of the first of the first rebellion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I would love to see a how maybe a post a, a a sequel to Mockingjay, but not about Katniss, about rebuilding the Capitol. How do they rebuild after the like after the war? Mm-hmm. Uh, featuring Hamish, seeing Hamish's story, a character analysis on Hamish during his Hunger Games. I think that there's a lot of ways that that those political ideas can be expressed in different ways Mm -hmm. and can still be interesting without it being directly connected to the thing that she put out. I think if it's a direct connection to the thing that she put out, that's giving into like the like, oh, more fans want this. So I Mm -hmm. have to draw more of this rather than telling the stories that I think that she might have been sitting on for the last 10 years. I feel like Hamich is having a Hamich story would be a fantastic idea. Like out of everything you listed, that one intrigues me the most. As soon as yeah. I open my mouth to say this, Rar says, I miss Hamich, my beloved. Yes. <laughs> so like, I don't, I, I don't know if I necessarily want a story about District 13 because I feel like, I mean, we could, it would probably be Suzanne Collins's version of Animal Farm, you know, like about how it's very easy for socialists and um, communist ideas to become authoritarian very quickly. Like, I feel like that's what it would be. It would be Animal Farm. Um, so that might be cool. Um, but out of everything that you said, I, like Hamish, yeah, Hamish's story would I don't be necessarily, so cool. Hamish's story would be really cool. I don't necessarily, uh, you know, whose Phoenix story would also be really cool. Phoenix story uh, would be so cool. I, but I also don't need any of these. Yeah. Like that's the thing too is I didn't need Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. However, it expanded the world when I got it. Yeah. Uh, and I like, I, I'm, I, I'm gonna repeat the thing that I said last week. At this point in time, I would trust Suzanne Collins with anything in this world. Yeah. She has not proven untrustworthy with this world, with any of this. Uh, However, I think it's important to acknowledge, even though we haven't gone through our whole list yet of the ones that we're talking about, I'll spoiler alert you. uh, This, she's only produced one thing outside of her series. Mm -hmm. So we can't be tired of it yet. We can't be tired of it yet because it's only one thing. It's the only one thing. Um, it, and it was a really well done thing. It gives me hope for other things. I think it was done correctly and right and is stands out from all of the other things that we're listing. But I, I there's only four books mm-hmm. in here. Mm-hmm. It's not that much compared to the other things we're talking about it's the smallest of our list so of course we're not tired of it yet of course we're like this is a good idea this is awesome in ways that we're not going to say about anything else so yeah this is um for for hunger games this is cautionary tale cautionary tale don't do what these other franchises did for the love of fucking god please and again i i feel like she has set it up that she's not Mm -hmm. 10 years is a long time for all i mean and the reality is is that for all we know suzanne collins i don't know what she was doing in the intern but she might have done the thing that jkr tried to do and failed to do of writing under a pseudonym it's very yeah. common for authors to write under pseudonyms even even bestsellers mm-hmm. uh because we haven't seen much from her Mm -hmm. in the way of what she's worked on so maybe she has continued to be writing and she wanted to return to the story or maybe she hasn't and this was just an idea that popped into her head but whatever it is i trust her yeah 
So hopefully the Hunger Games stays good and hopefully it dies before it gets bad. <laughs> That's our hope for the Hunger Games. What is, what's that fat Batman quote? Uh, you either die or you live long enough to see yourself turn the villain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. literally what this is. Die a hero or hilarious. live long enough to see yourself become the villain is the quote, <sighs> yes. So hopefully it dies before <laughs> before it gets crazy. All right, Karen, you want to you wanna tell them what we're doing next? Since okay. Give away what our next year is going to look like. Okay. We haven't been secretive yeah. about it. We but. haven't been secretive. Okay, we haven't. But officially announcing for sure it's happening, you guys, that we've hinted at a few times. 2024, coming to and prob- your... And probably most of 2025. Probably 2025, <laughs> too, yeah. Coming to you live on twitch.tv slash it's Karen and Terry. On Saturdays, we're going to be talking about... Twilight. Ah! Okay. We have to, you guys. We did Harry Potter. We did Hunger Games. Now we have to do Twilight. I, um, I'd have to tell you, okay, I was a not like other girls Twilight hater. Confessions, I know. Evil, awful of me. So we're going to read Twilight as adults and give our takes. There is the revival going on right now. Okay, because it's not just the original Twilight for books. There's also a book from Edward's perspective. There is a gender swapped book. There is, you know, there is so much. There is so much Twilight. Shorts, a short novella. Yeah, there's a novella. There's a novella. There's yes, there's all the movies. The movies. Um, so, yeah, what is it? Uh, there's five five movies because they broke the last one in half or did they not break the last one in half and there's four movies no they broke the last one okay in there's, half so there's stupid. five movies so there's five uh movies. yeah oh god the last hey, one in half is probably the worst of all of the i can't ya splitting in half movies i can't wait um, i cannot wait to talk about that scene in the movie where you think the war is actually happening you think it's you think you're actually getting the payoff that you wanted but oh no it's just a vision <gasps> I can't wait. Sorry, I blacked out and was thinking of part one (laughs) of Breaking Dawn while you were saying that because I remember that that movie is nothing happens in it. Nothing happens in it. (laughs) Nothing happens in that book, I should say. Where says Breaking Dawn, Dawn, Breaking Dawn part one was boring as fuck. I have no memories of Breaking Dawn part one. I have to tell you, and this must, this must be the reason. I have no memories of it. It's literally, it's literally their wedding. Mm-hmm. And their honeymoon. Mm-hmm. So half of it is like them. Well, one part of it is them fucking, and then most of it is them like Edward being like, "I left bruises on you, so I'll never touch you again." But we're married. <laughs> it's a whole thing. That's the that's the movie. My sister took me to watch it, and all I remember was a fluffy wolf, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. Ringing endorsement. There's nothing. <laughs> uh this is like looking at this, recognizing that uh, life and death, which is the hair, which is the gender swapped version, is not on here. Um, that's as many books as Harry Potter's. Mm-hmm. Seven books. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be long. Okay, but let's talk about Twilight in the context of continuing the story. Because yeah. here's the thing: Twilight, um, kind of recently on the internet in the zeitgeist, had a revival. Right. And um, and a bunch of people started looking into it again uh, and kind of being like, you know what? Maybe I was wrong about Twilight. Maybe it was actually had redeeming qualities. So there's there's a little bit of context which appears, which is important. Uh, I believe it was two years ago. Midnight Sun was uh, Mm -hmm. published. However, this was the third time that the book was supposed to be published. Yes. Uh, it was originally supposed to be published, I think, four-ish years after uh, Breaking Dawn was published. Yeah, because it was announced um, like pretty close yes, after Breaking Dawn was, was published that Midnight Sun was coming, and then it yes. kept getting new release dates. The reason for that is, uh, I think the first reason was for editing reasons, uh, but then it leaked mm-hmm. online. Four four to six chapters leaked online. Mm-hmm. And Stephanie Meyer, rightfully so, uh, was very upset about the fact that not only her publishers let a leak happen, but that the fans then continued to consume the leak. Oh, yeah, because people were rabid dark. for this leak. Rabid. Yes. She went dark. Uh, she went back. She had written the host previous to that, but she she stopped writing. Like she, she was like, Midnight Sun's not going to happen. Nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Then she tried to come back and she was like, well, maybe I'm thinking of Midnight Sun. 
And Phantom found the leaked things again. Mm -hmm. And they spread again. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a version came out that is still not sure if it was an early publication of it or if it was a fandom version of it. Uh, But people, again, got rabid. And she did not like the fan reaction and went dark again. And then finally, I believe in 2020, she published Mm -hmm. Midnight Sun. Finally. Finally, uh, 12 years after Breaking Dawn. So, e. <laughs> um, it, Boy, was you're crazy. A, it was a journey to uh-huh. get here. Uh-huh. And, and people, the thing yeah. is, is though, is that it that sparked this actual Twilight revival where people read Midnight Sun. It was from Edward's perspective, and then they were like, "Oh, let me go back and reanalyze it. Let me rethink about it." Yeah. There was reanalysis on the books and the movies alike, um, and people were like, basically decided, "Y'all, it ain't that bad. It's it's there's parts of it that are okay, actually." It's, it's- YA romance. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not that bad. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it. We'll dive into the the problems and the everything like that. Um, but I think that like this is an interesting combination and also so different from the previous two that we've talked about. Because here we have Twilight following very similarly, at least at first, the structure that Harry Potter did, which was produce as much as you can to keep it alive in the media. Um, that's coming up with a short story of the second short life of Brie Turner. Although I think that was between Eclipse and Breaking Dawn, if I remember correctly. Uh, I, I looked up the there, publishing order at one point in time, and I do think it was after Breaking Dawn, but it was okay, very cool. soon after. It was very, very, it was very close after. Uh, life and Death was probably within two years yeah. of it. Midnight Sun was then supposed to be two years after that. Like, it was supposed to be relevant and kept in the relevancy of the eye. However, because this wasn't, like, the the Twilight fandom, especially after Breaking Dawn Part 2, the movie came out, started dying pretty rapidly. Uh, this was, in my opinion, the thing that J.K. Rowling wasn't doing, which was, like, trying to stay relevant with, like, engaging in her own stuff. Uh, J- Stephanie Meyer was. Mm-hmm. Host, she came out, she wrote The Host. It was not as successful as she wanted it to yeah, be. People didn't it like was it. not, people did not like it. People had found it very problematic. Uh, I'm trying to convince Karen to let us read it as part of this, because I think it gives great insight to stephanie as as a yeah, writer i haven't read the host i know nothing about it other than people don't like it um and so she was trying to stay relevant and and make money bank stuff all the, like all the things mm-hmm. was trying to stay at her job and chase the fame uh in a way that jkr like was it was so out of her hands at that point there was nothing to chase she was famous um stephanie meyer didn't hit that But then we also have that long gap, very similarly to Hunger Games, of like 12 years between Midnight Sun and Breaking Dawn. Um, But that was for eco reasons. Yeah. Rather than like, let me sit on this thing and let me get an idea. Legitimately so. Yes. (laughs) So it's kind of like, I have never seen anyone say, please stop making more Twilight. Like, I've not seen that. I don't think that people really overall feel that way. But do you do you say like when if she released a new and, thing, would you post? Oh, would life you say and death? that? When Life and Death came out, I was like, why the fuck are we having? Because it was it was announcing Midnight Sun and Life and Death at the mm-hmm. same time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why the fuck should we have Twilight Part One three different ways? But did people it's say that from Midnight Sun? Because I feel like people said that and then they read it and they were like, no, I like this actually. Not when it came not when it came out in 2020, but at that time, when it was like when it was when it was originally announced, yeah, there was a large part of the fandom because also Breaking Dawn Part 2 fucking sucked. Oh my god, it sucks we so were, much. Breaking Dawn in general <laughs> sucked so much. And here's the other thing too. Kieran sat there and said that she was a like not like other girls. I was a Twilight hater. I was drinking the Twilight Haterade. I was a diehard Twilight, Twilight, Twilight. Like I, I was in it. Uh, I loved it. So like Breaking Dawn, I, oh God, Edward and Bella probably 
was some of my first fan fiction I, I was the first fan fiction I ever wrote. Uh, when and you read, you first... read, you read, you read on Fifty Shades when it was called Masters yeah. of the Universe, right? Yes, yeah. I read Fifty Shades of Grey before it was published. Yeah, uh, it definitely got me into like the the R rated side of like or well, fan fiction was mm-hmm. Twilight. Uh, absolutely, it was a Twi hard. Um, still have some favorite fan fiction, Twilight fan fiction that I love. But Jesus, uh, when I when it was announced that Life and Death, Midnight Sun, and Twilight were all the same exact story, just from different perspectives or small twists on things, I was like, "Are you just copying and pasting the book? What is happening here? <laughs> I don't need any of this. Give me something else. Give me Leah's story. <laughs> That's what I want. Oh my I god, Leah's story would be Leah's so story. good. Okay, so but Stephanie Myers would bungle that. She shouldn't do it. I don't know, but somebody should. <laughs> yeah, Fifty Shades was originally He-Man. Yeah, didn't you know? Yeah. Didn't you know? It was originally He-Man, duh. <laughs> yeah, so I was not that into Twi Hard. Like, I think um, Rar made a comment. Let me scroll up and find this um, that I vibe with. I oscillated between Twilight hating and just being, eh, I don't care anymore. And then Twilight hating, they'd be like, oh, maybe, maybe it's not good to look down on girls for their hobbies. Um, and now I'm back to super not caring. Yeah, Rar, I vibe with that mostly because like every time a new Twilight book would come out, the Twilight fever would like ramp up and I'll be like, I fucking hate this. I can't fucking, why? Why does everyone love this so much? Oh my God. But honestly, like it was more about like me and like how I felt about romance at that age than anything Twilight was doing. Okay. And then like it would die down. It would die down. It would die down. And I'd be like, it's whatever. It's whatever. Like, don't look down on people for their hobbies. You have weird, stupid hobbies too. Don't, don't do that. And then another one would come out and I'd be like, I hate this shit. (laughs) And it would go back and forth between that until um, I got into my adult years. And then I was like, okay, yeah, actually, like, I have way too many emotions about this that should not exist inside of me. (laughs) I have some really fun stories with Twilight uh, and my youth because Mm -hmm. I I was the perfect age. I think I started reading Twilight eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were Uh, the exact target demo. I was the exact right age. Mm Mm-hmm. And at that point, Twilight, New Moon, and Eclipse had just come out. So, like, I hit that sweet spot. Uh, and so I have some great stories that I'm going to hold off and not tell until we do our analysis. You will yeah. get lots of Landon youth stories uh, and my reaction to things as we talk about mm-hmm. Twilight. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Landon. If they mm. decided to make, like, a movie of Life and Death or a movie of Midnight Sun, what would your reaction be? it's the same thing uh first of all life and death is stupid uh because it doesn't actually make any sense uh oh and then midnight sun is literally the exact same movie just from edward's perspective with like five extra scenes most of it takes place in his head I can't wait. Most of it takes place in his head, imagining how to kill her. Was it fantastic? Did I love it as an adult? I was like, yes, thank you for acknowledging the monster that we, like, Edward actually was. You could not have published this when we were teenagers, uh, because it would not go over well, but as an adult, I appreciate it. But it's so... (laughs) It's not a movie. There so what not if, need to be any more Twilight movies. Okay, but what if, like, what if she wrote a book from one of the other's perspective? Like, what if she wrote, like, the Carlisle book? Would you read that? I would love the, I would love the Carlisle book. However, mm-hmm. I don't think she would. <laughs> she no, she'd wouldn't. probably write the Jasper book. <laughs> she wouldn't. She, I mean, yeah. She might write the Jasper book. <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie Meyer. I didn't mean for that burn to be so sick. <clears throat> so much of the Jasper book is what eclipses. Like it's like four four chapters in Eclipse. I think um books that I would enjoy but also like don't want her to write because I don't like her writing and think she wouldn't do it well. Carlisle and Esme's story. Mm-hmm. Uh I would love I would love Alice's story. Oh I my god, love I love Leah's Alice's story. story. I actually think Stephanie I Meyer mean, might could do Alice's story. I need Leah to imprint on a woman. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Find please. out that she's a lesbian. Uh, and it'd be a whole ass thing because it's like, oh shit. No wonder it was never going to work between me and Sam. Um, it, <sighs> yeah. Did this book franchise it's ever so get a bad. TV series? No, there is just these books plus Life and Death. 
um, not pictured, oh, yeah. and uh, and the five movies. That's it. And I don't think it ever will. Uh, I think a it's past its prime, and b uh, so many TV shows of vampires came out around this and inspired off of this concept. Uh, especially ones that have flopped since then yeah. that I, I think even with the original idea, no, no producer, no show or studio would be willing to take. I, I don't think so either because like they made the adult version, which was, um, what was the show called? A uh, true blood. So they made the adult version, which was based off the Sookie Stackhouse novels. And then there was the one for teens that was, um, that was a uh, vampire yeah. diaries, right? Buffy was way before Buffy was way before yeah. not related. Um, and very different kinds of vampires. You can tell. Yeah, like- <laughs> yeah. Buffy isn't really related to the Twilight craze, but the fact, mm-hmm. but they, but when they made the when they made True Blood, they were based off of the Sookie Stackhouse books. But there was clear inspiration from Twilight in the TV show. The books were way before Twilight, to be clear. And then, yeah, um, so- and then for Vampire Diaries, the Vampire Diaries show is very different than the Vampire Diaries books, and a lot of what's in the show is also inspired by Twilight. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I feel like Twilight, where this, it's like in this really sweet spot where it's like got just the right amount of content and like it should stop right now. Yeah, I, it, it, it could have stopped three books ago and it wouldn't have changed my life. <laughs> the last three books didn't change my life other than making my heart speed during this conversation. <laughs> I can't wait to read them all with you. And the fact that we're now going to have to read this so, many books and I'm so, going to have to read Twilight that many times. This is the thing. This is the thing that I'm so excited about. So we had Harry Potter that was like, you know, there was so much to bitch about. There was so much to bitch about. And then we had Hunger Games, very little to bitch about. I'm excited to get back to something we have a lot to bitch about. I'm so excited. It's going to be so fun. The, the thing is, is that I, I feel like with Harry Potter, I kept my nostalgia love for it. Yeah. Which means that, like, I had a passion on dissecting the things, but at the root of everything, it is a huge building block of who I am as a person. True. Twilight is that, like, that problematic and that deeply ingrained, but I have no love for it anymore. (laughs) So I'm just like, oh, good. We're just going to be critiquing things that are just going to be, they're not, they're not as bad as the media made it seem like mm-hmm. in 2012. Well, I just, I just think that the things that are bad about them are different than what a lot of people say is what's bad about them. I also think, yeah, I also think um, Twilight had a huge impact on what the YA genre and now new adult genre and what genre and book buying looks like. Mm-hmm. I, I genuinely think Twilight single-handedly raised a generation of romance readers. Yeah. Uh, and why the romance genre is now like no longer a shameful paper bag book mm-hmm. and is instead something that people can talk billions about and billion dollars in, billions of dollars in the industry yeah i tried reading them yeah. a few years back I mean, it's, and always could not... a, it's always been a huge industry yeah rar says i tried yeah. reading them a few years Sorry. back and could not do it i wish you all the luck thank you for the luck thank you thank you the impact it had on the industry is more interesting to me than any of the content. Yeah, of course, we're going to talk about that. As you guys know, we always talk about like um, how how we believe this impacted the publishing industry um, when these very big, you know, these large tentpole franchises came out. So we'll do the same thing for Twilight. Absolutely. Well, and also we, we talk about how it impacts the industry, but we also talk about how it impacts culture. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think that that's the other thing, too, that's going to be so interesting to talk about Harry with Twilight, because with Harry Potter. Oh, my God, the Twilight it, it fandom was, is bonkers. Well, Harry Potter was in, in, in majority women, but yeah. also but also geared towards a gender neutrality. Mm hmm. The Twilight movement was solely women. It was all women. If you were if you were a guy that liked Twilight, that was weird. It never. I it it, it happens. I'm not going to say never, but that it was so rare, mm-hmm. and I also feel like so unpopular to do that to mm-hmm. be that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, Twilight was for the girlies, and yeah. that's something that's incredibly important in this. I wish I had this passion for books. Well, Blue, maybe you should read along Twilight with us next year. <laughs> hey, read Fourth Wing. That's what I'm going to say, too. Read Twilight, but also read Fourth Wing, and that'll yeah. get you passionate about books. Speaking of reading Fourth Wing, before we go to the next one, um, who's sponsoring this episode, Landon? Oh, my God, it's Audible. Audible is sponsoring this, po- this, 
this episode. Uh, oh my god, I'm my doing almost every epi- episode. I don't have a slide for it. There it goes. Uh- <laughs> there it goes. My shit was. I thought my shit was still broken. Yeah. Okay. If you want to get more into reading, you want to go to audibletrial.com/slash/interstagewindow and get a free month. You'll get a free book. I love audiobooks. That's the main way that I read nowadays. It's the best. It's amazing. Um. So yeah, blue. Go to Audible, get Fourth Wing, which is actually good. <laughs> it's so good. Um, Karen hasn't read it yet. I'm bullying mm-hmm. her into it. Yeah, Fourth point. Wing isn't as good as I wanted it to be, unfortunately, but I did finish it. So there's that ringing endorsement what? from Rar there. I've heard that, though, too. I've heard that, though, too, Landon. It's the popular thing. And so I think people go in with really high expectations and then it doesn't meet them because that's not the Tragic. first person I've heard say that. I'm in a reading slump right now uh, because Iron Flame, which is a sequel, comes out in less than a month. And my brain is like, you can't read anything else but this book. And I'm like, but it's not out for a month. And what are you like, going to do for a month? Like, I, don't, I haven't picked up a book in two weeks. As oh someone who's God. read 150 books this year so far and haven't read in the last two weeks, I'm going insane inside of my brain. Yeah. So yeah, y'all should it's sign up for Audible because it's awesome. And if you do it with that link, you support us to make more of these fun streams that we do the world building kind of fell apart for me if i look too hard that's all i'll say here okay that makes sense that makes sense uh, yeah i mean it's that's gonna happen with a lot of like a lot of fantasy books are like that so i understand it's the spoiler alert yeah don't Uh, spoiler it i haven't read it someday maybe no i meant i oh i changed the slide on accident oh okay okay Okay. Well, we can't move um, on now. We've done the sponsor segment. Guys, go get Audible. Thank you. Speaking of uh, fantasy novels, let's talk about Sarah J. Mass. Akatar. I don't know anything is, about Akatar, Landon. Enlighten yes. me. This is, this is this is not Kara, Karen's forte. I put this on here because I needed to talk about this. Uh, anyone who has listened to these streams before, who knows me, uh, who's who's been a part of my twitter sphere or anything like that it probably knows that i am a court of thorns and roses girly uh that court of silver flames i is changed my life i still cry when i read it it's uh amazing and fantastic it's the book series that really inspired me to start reading again uh like to the abundance that i am reading it made me fall in love with new adult fantasy all of that kind of stuff uh, i came in late to the sarah j mass universe i came in when uh we were this many books all of the thorn and glass series and all the way up to a quarter frost and starlight was already published uh so we were several books in uh to the sarah j mass universe at this point and what I loved is that there was a woman who was writing fantasy novels that were separate from each other. And it was fantastic. And you could read one series without having to read the other. And that was great. And then that stopped. Oh, and then dun, that dun, stopped. Dun. Uh, very, very few spoilers. However, there is, I, I will not give any details. I'm not going to give anything. But there is something that has happened in a recently published book that has connected two of these series together that is now making it very hard to understand read and grasp the depth of story if you haven't read seven of these books it it is no longer standalone series they are now interconnected and there is becoming more and more proof that everything is interconnected uh i the, the book that this is going to impact the most has not been out yet uh however i cannot see how it's not going to hinder the reading if you don't have the understanding of several books in Mm. so what that and like also they're different genres and different levels of like they're all ya or not ya new adult fantasy but the ones like urban fantasy which is modern day ideal ideas and world and one is uh like high fantasy (laughs) so like but they're connected they're connected okay uh and the and like like crossover connected so it's so all of a sudden the buy-in goes from hey i really like this series to i now have to understand an entirely other series to Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that expands the universe 
in a way that's so detrimental to the fandom. Yeah, like um, while you were talking about that, Ra was over here getting triggered the fuck out. <laughs> Sorry, friend. Um, And they ended on the Sarah J. Moss Cinematic Universe. The SJ MCU. (laughs) Is that what it feels like? Is it really it feels like that? It's, it was fine before this need for a crossover. Mm -hmm. As soon as this idea of a crossover happened, then it was like, oh, I can't read either of these series without investing in the other one. Which for a reader is fine. But for someone who's casual or maybe doesn't want high fantasy or doesn't want this version, like, because that's the other thing, too. Over on this side, the Thorn of Glass series is YA, where on this side is more fantasy new adults. So, you know, teenagers versus adults. And then the ones at the um, bottom, those are urban fantasy, right? Are urban fantasy. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, it's, it's not quite like United States urban fantasy, but it is like guns and modern day technology and all of that kind of stuff so it's like we're mixing and matching genres and characters and now you have to buy into all of these things to understand the deeper me- meanings and it's getting to the point where it's going to start hindering the writing the writing is on the wall for that you can see the future and it's like oh no unless you're bought in at this point it's too late <laughs> Oh my gosh. So like if you started now, you would have to read the young adult ones, the new adult ones, and the urban fantasy ones. In my opinion, you'd probably get away with just reading, at least as of right now, the new adult high fantasy, which is the Court of Thorns and Roses, and the urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So at this point, that's seven books Mm -hmm. of two different series, of two different lores, of two different Mm -hmm. everythings. Two different uh, cast of characters, way, whatever. These, two different cast of characters. And all these books are an average of anywhere between four and 700 pages. Okay. So these are large. So they, books. I mean, they are typical fantasy books, They're pretty dense fantasy, and massive. Yes. Okay. And massive, high lore, high all of that. Well, like, well written. I am a huge Sarah J. Mass fan. Like I said, Akatar is one of, is, is hits me in the heart. But. It's so much and it's now like getting to that point where it's like, ah, this is untenable to people who are trying to get into it. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to start losing people who maybe didn't like Crescent City, who didn't like the Akatar versions of things. Mm-hmm, I can mm-hmm. see the chat moving. I can't read any of it because <laughs> it's on yours, but I can see it moving. <laughs> most most of it is blue and we're having their own conversation, but um, but this is a comment I do want to oh, okay, read. Good. Brandon Sanderson has a weird interconnectivity between all of his massive series, but it's yes. so small that you don't have any need to read all the Mistborn and then all the Stormlight archives. I personally think it's irritating even as that small, but it sounds far preferable to Sarah J. Moss making it necessary to read all the series is. Yeah, I agree. I think tiny little Easter eggs in between, like they're, they can be a little annoying, but they're not problematic. They can even be fun sometimes. But these like connections that are so deep that make you feel forced to read yes. the other series, that is incredibly problematic. And I will tell you exactly why. The problematic for people like, I am fucking busy. Okay, I have a lot of things that I have to do. I, I have you know, I have a 40 hour a week job and a house to take care of and four cats. And I have my own hobbies and I don't have room for new hobbies. So if I want to read something and I realize I'm going to have to read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 books to actually like catch up. And I'm never, ever going to fucking read that. I will ne- never, it will never happen. It doesn't matter how good it is. And I and I think the most like infuriating thing is that it started that way. Brandon Sanderson, I do agree, does it really well, where you have these individual series that can have some interconnectedness, some historical relevance that means the same, but you can read each on their own. That's what this was originally, mm-hmm. until it wasn't, mm-hmm. and that's the problem mm-hmm. of like, okay, awesome. When I thought it was originally a set three separate series awesome fantastic great Yeah, because it's like you read one of them and then you're like if i like this there's two other series i could read and that's good yes and i can get invested in these characters and this thing and this story 
But now all of a sudden it's a chore that you have to read something. And like these Crescent City books, they're not the average 400. They're the average 600 to like 800. Like they're huge. Mm -hmm. They're thick boys. I'm trying to see if I have one. I do. That's a big boy. That's a big old boy. boy. It's bigger than my head. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are huge. And it takes a lot of time. And it's a lot of lore. And... So all of a sudden it's like, oh, it, it it's like that miss, it's like I feel betrayed almost in some ways where it's like, oh, I thought I was getting this thing and now you're telling me I'm not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now because Throne of Glass is not connected, it, it's connected in those Easter egg ways, but it's not connected to the crossover story yet. I don't trust her to not. You think she's going to connect it even worse, sir? I don't know. And I don't like, and that's the thing too, of being like, fuck, how am I going to still continue to be invested in the series if I, cause I haven't read Thorn of Gra- Glass and no longer there. I'm not interested in it. it. It doesn't, I don't like the writing. She wrote the first one. She was 16. It's bad. It's bad. Um, <laughs> no, that makes sense. Like things I wrote when, when I was 16 were also bad. Yeah. So and I know that there's a lot of love for it. It gets better over time, but I just don't, you're, I'm busy too. I don't have the want or need to read the series. Yeah. But if I'm looking like I have to, in order to understand what's going on in the series that I do want to read. Yeah. Then it's like, well, I'm done then. So, okay. So let me ask sucking. you this. Does the fandom basically feel the same way? Are there SJMCU defenders? There are. Uh, there are, because I think that, it was a really cool thing mm-hmm. uh, when it happened because Akatar is beloved and a lot of people read Crescent City because they love Akatar. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure Crescent City would have done as well on its own if Akatar hadn't had made it so large into the bestsellers list. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like this really cool thing of being like, oh, we get it's it's the thing we get to see these people again. But as the implications of what this means has started coming out of it, like being like, oh, you know, House of, House of Breath and Sky, which is the Crescent City novel, was the most recent one to come out. And instead of getting another Akatar book, we're now getting another House of Flame and Shadow. We're now getting another Crescent City book, the House of Flame and Shadow. But that's going to involve things that then are going to have to then go back to Akatar or go back to the series. So it's like, okay what the heck is happening Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Mm -hmm. i think that the implications the fandom has started spiraling with i see okay okay karen's the colorful aspect of laden so good it reels me in more than any book could oh my god thank you so much blue that's the best and then crushes me with sadness that's exactly what i'm here for that's what i love to do (laughs) um rar asks do you think sarah j moss is doing this specifically for the fans do you think like she's doing it for the fans do you think she's doing it for her like comment on that I think it's a job. I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant marketing technique. I think it's a brilliant marketing technique. Marketing. You have a series that's not doing as well. Um, whether that be, whether that be her as a writer, realizing that her series that she might love, that she's putting everything into is not doing as well. Throwing in characters that are, that are guaranteed bestsellers mm-hmm. into the second and third book of a series is going to guarantee that you make those sales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she's Uh, getting people to buy the books that aren't selling as well because that's the book she actually wants people to buy. It's a marketing thing. If that's the purpose, then that brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. Like a brilliant idea from the marketing perspective. I don't know her intentions. From the like fan like service thing uh it also gives great fan service we have these favorite characters that we love that we want to bring in uh from the mcu sort of aspect of things of being Mm -hmm. like oh well i wanted to connect all these universes and now i found a way to connect it and instead of doing easter eggs i'm gonna super connect it like that could work too it does feel very (laughs) mcu Everything you're explaining feels very MCU to me. It is very, it was like a, and it was cool at first, very much like the MCU was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it got weird. Mm-hmm. And then, and now we're all spinning of being like, what the fuck is she going to do? And then what does this mean for the rest of it? 
Did you ever watch play Lady Layton? No, but I've played the first like three or four Layton games. So I know what you're talking about. Um, okay, so Sarah J. Moss, something that if I ever needed a new series to completely take over my life, I can get into that. But otherwise, I shouldn't touch it is what I'm hearing. No, because I want you to read Akatar. <laughs> but you've just told me that it's going to I'm going to eventually no, feel no, like no, I have no, to no. read you the others read, if I read Akatar. You can, you can read up till Court of Silver Flames and then be good. Mm. It's, it can it can be it can feel complete then. I promise you, Karen. OK. All right. I believe you. That's only, believe that's you. only, four, that's only five books. And sure. one of them, one of them is a novella. So that's only oh, four books. Oh, really. even better. So it's really four, four and a half books. Okay. All right. Well, Sarah J. Moss, you are going down a scary road. Please stop. You can stop no, now. Stop. You can stop now. I believe in you. But also, like, fans are going to be so angry if she stops now, too. Yeah. Because, like, imagine it being, like, a five-second crossover. Yeah. And then people being like, wait, I invested all this time and energy. Like, there uh-huh. is no right way to go here. She, like, jumped off the cliff and didn't think of the landing. Mm-hmm. 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 And whatever, and however she lands, people are not going to like it. <laughs> Well, that sucks. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Just read the wiki after that. True. Okay. Well, we're going to go from the SJMCU into the MCU. Wow. Oh, my oh, gosh. Jesus. Okay. So here is the end result of where Sarah J. Moss is going if she keeps with this. Okay. I want to ask you, who cares about MCU post Thanos? Who how many people? I will tell you, it's zero people. Nobody. But here's the deal. I disagree with that. Well, MCU, nobody cares. The The whole universe, nobody cares. Nobody cares. However, I think that there are Loki fans that really care about Absolutely. Loki. I, oh my God, because it's actually good. I need to watch the second season, honestly, truly. The first season was really good. Um, but I think other, go back a slide. Black- <laughs> no, we're not going back. We're not going back. And I think there are Black Panther fans who really care. Black Panther um, was great. Other- I don't want a sequel though now since the guy passed away. Honestly, truly, I don't. I, don't I, have, see I haven't seen. It. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's uh, great. Black Panther was I've, great. I, well, Black no, Black Panther, Panther was is fantastic. Thanos. It was pre. No, Black Panther was great. Black Panther two already came out. I didn't watch it because it didn't have the guy. So I have no idea about it. Honestly, okay. I've heard that it's really good. <laughs> Um, if you need to have a <laughs> image list about the watch order for what it is you have produced, and it is not in order already, yeah, you've done too much, yeah. Like, yeah. I've never even heard of these things, the consultant. Item 47. What is it? I don't know what item 47 is. What, what if? Oh, I do know what what if is. But I, I have no it. idea what what if is. Okay, y'all. This isn't even all of them. This no. is like, this like stopped in last year. Yeah, this is not even close to everything. Okay, so here's the deal. I loved the MCU at the beginning. I thought it was like really amazing. I thought it was so cool. I thought it was like a modern version of like an epic, like Oedipus in the Iliad type of story. I thought it was the coolest fucking thing. Here's the mistake. After Thanos, they didn't have like another large overarching story, another big bad, right? So they're like, fuck, what do we do? We uh, we want to keep making this much money. We got to make the money. We got to make all the money. We're not going to be happy unless we have all the money. And then they said, we have a brilliant idea. Okay, there's Disney Plus. We're going to make TV shows. And now you have to watch the TV shows too, or you don't know what's going on in the movies. Brilliant. Every, I feel like at that point, everybody was like, I'm out. No. Here's, that is too here's much time. Thing, I will not. Here's the thing that really pisses me off about that is they started with that, though. They sure. had that already. However, it wasn't the movies were not dependent on the tv shows exactly the TV but then shows they became dependent. were based off of the movies yeah but or but like so i'm thinking like the it was the mcu i loved when the mcu gave us shield when mcu oh, shield was gave good. us uh jessica jones yes. and luke cage and daredevil mm-hmm. loved that fantastic uh because i could enjoy 
the thing with all of the references, with all of the Easter eggs in the same world. But it wasn't actually not consequential. Have to, not have to watch every single thing. Yeah. Uh, I also think the detriment is that they started coming out with three freaking movies and TV shows a year. Too much. And no one has time for that. No. Nobody ain't got time for that. I can't dedicate my life to Marvel. Yep. Here's the exact breaking point. The moment it happened was when, for to watch the new Doctor Strange, to get the context of the new Doctor Strange and to understand what's going on in that movie, you had to have watched the WandaVision TV show. What? Why? Why did they do this? This was the dumbest fucking decision. It, and nobody cared. Nobody wanted to do that. It, that was it's Doctor Strange and, and WandaVision are two completely well, different target audiences. No, it no. And then also, didn't they like? I never watched the Doctor Strange movie, like the the one that was WandaVision. But didn't they also like contradict some things that happened in WandaVision yes. as well? Yes. So not only did they require you to watch it, they then didn't continue on. Yes, like, and it, they what didn't it have did, the continuity. And what it did was turn the Doctor Strange movie into Wanda the movie featuring Doctor Strange. And like, why am I going to go to a Doctor Strange movie and the main character is Wanda having the exact same conflict she had in the TV show and not moving past it or reaching any resolution whatsoever that the TV show implies she is going to reach at the end? Why? But this is what happens. It's stupid. It was so stupid. Marvel, just stop. You don't need to have all the money in the world. Please stop. I beg you. Well, then they... Then then they did that with Hawkeye and Black Widow, which mm-hmm. like Black Widow takes place before anything. The Black Widow and so it's so like, bad. I'm sorry, Scarlett Joe. You was have so bad. to. You then have to go back. Don't say sorry to Scarlett Joe. She doesn't. She doesn't need it, and also she sucks. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't really suck. To... She's just doing her thing. Anyway, okay. Uh, you then have to like go back to before it was relevant, before we mm-hmm. cared about anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you also had to have information about Hawkeye in yeah. order to understand it. The Hawkeye show was so, good, though, actually. I, I'm sure, like, <laughs> the thing is, like, WandaVision was great. Oh, Hawkeye, was I amazing. never watched it, but I've heard it was great things. Falcon mm-hmm. and Winter Soldier, I watched a few episodes, but I heard it was great. Like, I, I, all of these are good. I really loved Eternals. Like I did enjoy the movie Eternals. Uh, however, how it connects to the larger everything else, I have no freaking idea. Yeah. Like the, the thing the, that they're producing too much and having no continuity and no sense of direction with producing these. Yeah. Yeah. MCU ruins Spider Man. Anyone that says otherwise is coping. Scalding hot take. That is a that is a scalding. That is a a spicy hot pepper take. Blue. That is like a five pepper on the Chinese menu take. That is spicy. Um, the point the MCU was ruined for me was when Iron Man three came out and he destroyed all his suits. And then the second Avengers came back and he had remade all his suits again. And I was even angrier after the ending of Thor Ragnarok was completely made pointless by the first half of the dumb Thanos thing. Exactly. Rar, the thing, okay. So the thing that I'm saying that actually broke everyone with the the WandaVision Doctor Strange, the the building blocks for that mistake were there so much earlier and they just ignored them and ignored them and ignored them. See, I somewhat disagree with that. Because I took some of that stuff as like, as a comic book reader, was very comic book familiar. These It, it built a story very similar to comic books, it was some, very similar to these comic books. Like I, I understood why they were doing that and that pattern. I didn't hate it. Was it great? No, but I didn't hate it. Well, and I think that's why the, people forgave it early on. And then eventually it yeah. got too much. The, the problem is, is that when they started producing, like when the when the studio started assuming that your life revolved around Marvel as much as the employees' lives revolve around Marvel. It's like people are not going home and and consuming 15 hours of Marvel in, in a week. They're not. Like, some people are, absolutely. <laughs> Very but, few. But, like, the, <laughs> the normal amount of human beings 
like the the average person doesn't have that time to contribute to this one thing yeah there's other and stuff i want to watch there was an assumption that like if you're a marvel fan you're gonna watch anything and everything to do with marvel and we're gonna make it required for you to understand anything else mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I'm also very... we can't make it required because that might lose some of the audience so we're gonna rewrite some... like it's it, it's so it... stupid I'm very much not a comic book reader, so that must be why I got pissy about it. Yeah, but here's the thing. Most people are not comic book readers, and what was great about early MCU is it gave a comic-esque type of story to non-comic book readers at a pace that non-comic book readers could handle. So yeah. that's what I mean when I say like the things that annoyed you were kind of the the first signs that this was going to go this way, because it's like now it's so comic booky, only incredible nerds could ever keep up with what was going on this has to yeah. be your one hobby if you're gonna follow it yeah yeah it sucks it does <laughs> suck yeah exactly like you're right blue it's literally too many there's too much there's too many shows there's too many movies and they're too interconnected like if you skip one you don't know what's going on and that's a problem that's a problem. So the MCU, like we've talked about these other franchises, like Harry Potter, Hunger Games, and Twilight, kind of like they're in various stages of like marching towards the too much. Like Harry Potter, we think is firmly on the too much side, right? But Marvel yeah. is so far past the too much side that it is like just waiting for the moment to crash and burn. I think that like something to acknowledge, though, is the cooks in the kitchen for this. Mm -hmm. like you don't like with twilight and hunger games and even to an extent harry potter you have the same creator behind all of it there's typically there's like one person there's one person jk rowling at the end of the day gets final say yeah uh stephanie meyer at the end of the day gets final say and suzanne Con collins at the end of the day sarah j mass at the end of the day gets final say uh, which is why I don't think Sarah J. Mass would ever become Marvel because she can't produce that much. Every single one of these has an entirely different production team, an entirely different writing staff, and an entirely different director mm -hmm. facing all of these that may or may not be in communication with other people on the project. Yeah. Like, the thing there's is, is like, no guarantee that their communication is any good. And it, But at the beginning of the MCU, the communication was very good. Because they yes. had Feige, like, at the at the head of it, and it was very tightly controlled. It was very, like, well-paced. And then they they realized that if they kept that same pace, they wouldn't, they wouldn't grow in the money they were making. They would just keep making the same amount of money, and that is just not acceptable in today's world. So they got to a pace where one person couldn't control it anymore. They were also investing in actors who yes. wanted to move on after 10 years. Like, yeah. like that's like, the other thing, They don't too, want to play that... the same character for their whole lives. With this, you you only have to worry about, uh, like, a few act like yeah they don't. With before it was like there was always a concern of whether or not Robert Downey Jr. was going to resign his contract. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, if he didn't resign his contract, Iron Man that you had spent the last decade building was meaningless. Yeah, if Chris Hemsworth didn't resign his contract, then Thor was. Useless, like which it turns out that he's not resigning his contract like there's a yeah. whole bunch of things to do with that too of like oh with time with with time there is risk mm -hmm. and they want to mitigate risk and mm -hmm. so let's throw a thousand things out with a thousand different actors mm -hmm. doing a thousand different things and we won't have to worry about well, what if one falls off? Because we have a thousand others. Yeah, but they're so interconnected. It makes like those of us that are watching it feel like, well, I don't want to invest in any of it. Because like, what if something that's important to the story is not something I care to watch? And then the yeah. next thing I care about isn't going to make any sense. And it's like, well, then why the fuck do I care about any of it? I'm just going to yeah. move on to some other, you know, fandom. I'll be honest. I'm not a huge Hawkeye fan. Didn't want to watch Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so I didn't. And yeah. then all of a sudden, missed out on a shit ton of stuff. Yeah. But like, my life went on. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you just moved on to other things, right? Yeah, hoping there's a season two that comes out next year. Oh, for Incredible? Yeah, hopefully. Um, boy, season four comes out next year, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, different. Boys is great. 
Yeah. Um, I actually just recently got into it because that Generation V show came out and I really liked the first episode and I was like, I'm going to give the boys a chance again. And uh, we started watching it and I'm really into it now. It's just the first couple episodes are very slow, um, but it's good. It's good shit. So yeah, Marvel, please stop. I, I, I can't wait for the day for this to die. Honestly, truly, I can't wait. Well, I think the thing is, is that we found a common denominator because mm -hmm. I don't think it's just Marvel's fault. No. I think that this is a Disney problem mm -hmm. because they're ruining another franchise in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Blue, you said it. You're going to riot if Star Wars isn't on the slides. Well, here it is. You don't have to riot anymore. You can still if you want to, but you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Star Wars came to Disney with a little bit already of a too much problem and Disney made it 20 times worse. Now it has a way too much problem. Who, is, yeah. who has time for all this? Who? Nobody. This is stupid. Well, here's the deal, right? Episode three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or not three, four, no, and five. Four, sorry. Five, four five, and six. Yeah, yeah. Great. Amazing. Deserved the prequels. Absolutely. George Lucas did it great. One, two, and three were fine. Two, one was bad. Two and three were good. There was a lot of connection with like Clone Wars and, and hitting that because that like hit the right generation in the right era it was fine uh there wasn't too much being produced mm -hmm. and then five movies got approved mm -hmm. three of which were just basic remakes of four five and six yeah just with different if you look characters. at a plot structure with different yeah. characters yeah and then also tv uh there were standalone with rogue one and solo yeah neither of which did particularly good or really well because no, no one wanted a standalone star wars movie they just wanted to make money mm -hmm. and then the tv show started happening again again with the again. required to watch tv shows again with this well, nonsense and this tv show started happening at such a rapid pace yes as well uh, and like uh <laughs> yeah I would still like to watch that one. Um, I can't even remember the name of it anymore, but it's like a Anders or Ander, something like that. Um, I would still like to watch that. I've heard it's good. I've never watched Mandalorian. I did watch the Obi-Wan show because I am an Obi-Kin degenerate. Okay, but I'm telling you right now, it's bad. Don't, if you don't want, if you don't care about Obi-Kin, don't watch it. It's not worth your time. It's like M Mandalorian did so good. Because here's the deal. Like, I don't mind if you try, especially because... I think movies are becoming obsolete, especially for, uh, they're not becoming obsolete. That's the wrong term. They're, they are becoming outdated. TV shows make sense. It's longer form story that you can tell over time with a budget that is similar to a movie. It's, it's because it's because of the way people consume the media, right? Yes. TV shows are the visual media now because people aren't going to the theater anymore. Yes. So I think that like, turning and making a tv show is fine i don't think there's anything wrong with that so but i think the problem is, is that they saw the success that the mandalorian had and went oh we'll make 10 of these yeah and you have to watch all of it to understand yeah, or none of it's going to make sense or like the or none of it's going to make, make sense and that's like the biggest problem yeah. is when it's like starting to be like oh you have it's the cinematic universe of like you have to watch this to understand this and this mm -hmm. to understand that it's mm -hmm. like i i think that if we we're able to keep things separate do what game of thrones and house of dragons is doing is like yeah they exist in the same world and there is a connection mm -hmm. but they don't have to do anything with each other mm -hmm. that would help that would be best yep why well, y'all gotta hate on the cinemas blue we don't hate the cinemas it's um it's just true it's just true people don't do that anymore I love the movies too. I love them, but I we don't do that really anymore. I love going to the movie theater. It's one of it's one of my favorite things. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. It's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, it's it's not worth like, it. Like it just it's not worth it. If I, I have to go have and that spend, I have limited time and money. I have to go spend forty dollars to take me and a friend to go see a movie that I can see for $5 next week or a subscription that I'm already paying for next week. Yeah. I don't have that kind of fucking money. I don't have that yeah. kind of time. Yeah. 
The story is getting too drawn out, having moved away from where it once started and what people once loved. I agree, Devon. I think that the other thing about Star Wars that is that is really unique to Star Wars in particular is that they have this kind of like push and pull between like what people love about Star Wars and like the Skywalker family and everything. And then also at the same time, everything being focused on the Skywalker family and there being kind of like, um, you know, uh, people are fatigued from that at the same time as that's what they love. And so because these they're so risk averse, they um, don't want to make what would be like the new Skywalkers, right? They just want to like milk what they already have. Hence, like we have the Mandalorian, right? Milking Boba Fett instead of, um, you know, putting something on like, giving us something new that still fits into the Star Wars universe. I actually am going to defend Mandalorian here because I've not seen it. I don't know, but I, I haven't, I can see I haven't what seen it, was. it either, but I can see the, I haven't seen it either. I'm going to say that. So this is nothing to do with the story and everything to do with, I think the thing is, is that Star Wars is by far the most successful sci-fi fantasy careful oh, yeah. putting in sci-fi fantasy in there because there's obviously really successful sci-fi stories but this is a sci-fi epic fantasy mm -hmm. it is the most successful of many generations and wanting to use it as an intro into sci-fi sci-fi fantasy for those who like are not willing who who don't who struggle with like emerging into a new world that they don't know the rules of makes sense to me it's mm -hmm. it's like the fan fiction of an actual media mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that's what i felt like the mandalorian did yeah was like oh you understand the rules and some of the concepts of this genre of what is here let me tell you a different kind of story that can exist inside of this genre yeah they then kept too close like that's the problem is that they just kept getting closer and closer to the original boba fett was far separated it's a it's an NPC in the like it is a it is an offshoot one off. Both character. Fett fans come for us and calling him an NPC. <laughs> Go ahead. The heck. But in the original, in the original, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Like he's he's, he's a bit he's, character. He's, he's, a, he's nobody. a bit character. Land yeah. like you can even argue Lando like like those characters that were in for only a couple of scenes are characters that you can go then follow. It's the Obi Wan's. It's the ones that are too close to the story that become problematic because it's like okay this is no longer about introducing into the genre and getting people comfortable and hitting them where they're already immersed you are now building off of the thing that you've already that you've already milked yeah, yeah. there's like a difference does that make sense yeah yeah and i think i think like what devon is saying here is like kind of the the culmination of it one in six one to six movies in between was more than enough seven through nine became oversaturation i do feel like it was during that final trilogy and releasing all the tv shows and all of that it was just literally it's the same thing as the mcu at the end of the day there's too much content straight up yeah. too much content um also rar says i haven't really watched any star wars tv shows but i heard andor is really good andor is the one i was thinking of it's supposedly really good i haven't seen it either um, I do think it's kind of a neat thing about Star Wars that you can make standalone stories in the universe of the IP without having to necessarily attach yourself to the main story, except for minimally. I'm hoping they can branch out with more original creators. Um, yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. So unlike some of, unlike the MCU where I'm just, I just think they should like fucking stop. Just, just stop. I think with Star Wars, I don't necessarily think they have quite as deep a problem as mcu because there are elements of it that are not interconnected like you can watch uh star wars things without having to watch all the star wars things like it's not quite the same problem as mcu but they have a pacing problem so it's similar yes. to the mcu in the pacing that there's two much star wars content so even though it's not interconnected which makes the problem not as deep as it is with the mcu the problem still exists like there's studios have to understand that there is only 24 hours in the day and there is a lot of content to watch because it's not just them like think about like the time that you spend in front of a screen the time you're spending right here right now watching this stream or if you're watching the VOD on YouTube okay that's time you could be watching Star Wars are you watching Star Wars right now fuck no you're not you're what you're here hanging out with us watching me right okay so it's not yeah. they're not just competing with other like hollywood studios they're competing with the internet also they're also competing with like people's attention in their lives 
of of like also oversaturation of things like people get tired if Mm -hmm. streamers don't like that stream every single day like or a show that's produced every single day might not get as many viewers because you could just check out tomorrow's i love you are we're so better than star wars (laughs) thanks i don't know but when you have (laughs) it's not but it's okay but when you have yeah so when you have like too much too fast yeah you're gonna burn people out yeah of the story yeah you you have to keep some of the like oh my god hype of of like like for me i've been waiting a year and a half for freaking bridgerton to come out right i just need bridgerton like but like if bridgerton different bridgerton stories came out every three months i'd be over it i'd be like whatever i'm never gonna watch this again yeah it's too much it's too much too much yeah, Mandalorian isn't part of the oversaturation. Neither is Book of Boba Fett. I'm just reading Devon's comment here. Obi Wan did give a lot of closure and answered all the questions. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I liked it a lot too, but it was not good. Like, let's it wasn't. I, I watched it and I liked it too. But now with Ashoka, from what I've seen, it seems like they're relying a fair bit on the Clone Wars era, which is cheap to go. Okay, yeah. So that's a good example of where MCU started like extra messing up where they're connecting things. Like just because like Clone Wars was forever ago, you don't want people watching Ashoka only be only the people that watched Clone Wars years ago. Like, that's dumb, right? So, I haven't seen Ashoka. There's too much content. I have not seen it, right? Like, not to sit there and complain about content. Like, if you're going to give us good stories, give us good stories. But that's the thing. They have to be good. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it and you're relying on the name of Star Wars and you think it's going to be a hit because of Star Wars, which they have done... That sucks. It's bad. Same thing with Marvel. They think it's going to be successful. And in part, it is successful because it's named Marvel. And that's when that oversaturation in that world is getting too much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I wish we could just move out of these giant IPs altogether and make some new ones. Praise. Okay. Thank you, Rar. That is the that is like my ultimate conclusion from like looking at all of these like tentpole we franchises. <laughs> But yeah, that's what I think. I just like, I feel like I am starved for a new interesting IP um, in a way that used to be frequent. It used to be frequent for me to be able to just hop into a new fandom and it be active and vibrant. And that is not true anymore. It takes a lot of work to find new, interesting, active fandoms because so much of it is oversaturated with these gigantic tentpole IPs. Karen, can I introduce you to a show called Dimension 20? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about Dimension 20, Landon. No, it's a D&D show. It's oversaturated. There are 20 seasons. You don't, need to, you don't need to sit why? there. Why? It's good. Why? Why? It's so good. I every believe season you, is different. but why? Every, almost every season is a new, is a new story. Like, yeah. is a new new world, new genre, new everything, new cast, <laughs> all that. I'm going to have to take um, my great, great, great grand nibblings to Harry Potter Gen 8 in eight years. Yeah. 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 Nothing ever dies. And, and, um... Oh, 80 years. I, I said not, eight. I meant 80. I am not sure, realistically, if we will have a new something. I'm not sure we will. Um, because that means that that's a lot of money on, on the line for the places that don't, like... The, the creative teams of places are <laughs> like it's so bad right now uh art and creating art is so hard and the studios aren't approving art mm-hmm, to be mm-hmm. created and obviously we're on a strike like our sag actors are still on a strike right now yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes from this writer strike if anything is created well but... aren't they they the writer strike is ended right it's just yeah. sag that's yes, on that strike is... now sag is on strike but i meant more of like um what was created during the writer's strike yeah if anyone was able to work on anything if if there are ideas that come from it uh but we've watched we watched for i i think it was over 120 days studios that are behind these ideas 
not be willing to pay their writers. Mm-hmm. To not replace their writers with AI. Mm-hmm. To not ensure that there's more than one writer on set. Mm-hmm. That's that is the level that they're not willing to risk money. Mm-hmm. They are absolutely not going to risk money on something that they aren't sure is a sure thing. Yeah. And the only things that they're sure are a sure thing are the things that have made money in the past. Yeah. Which is what I think is going to be the death of some of these big main studios. Yeah. And I think, and I just think that this problem we're seeing now, it doesn't have to get worse, but it will. It will. Um, yeah. Karen, can I introduce you to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Absolutely not, Blue. I know that's a zillion episodes. So no. I will tell you this, though. I did watch the se- the first season, the um, live action of One Piece, and I fucking loved it. I'm still not going to watch the One Piece anime. It's a zillion episodes. That is never going to happen. But I am very excited for the season two of that to come out because it was really good. So yeah. I don't recommend it if you don't like weird. I know it's weird. I know. I know I would like it, but no, it's a zillion episodes. It's not a zillion episodes. I don't believe you. JoJo's has been being written for forever. It's a zillion episodes. It's a zillion manga. No, absolutely not. Um. <laughs> so the point is, is that this problem is only going to get worse so long as we continue to tie art to capital in the way that we do and monetize it in the way that we do. I don't see this getting any better. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of a sad episode. I'm sorry, you guys, but that's my conclusion. What do you think, Landon? Support indie authors. Yeah. Support indie uh, indie uh, movie houses as much as you can. Know that these are not the genres that they're going to be able to operate in because the genres that, that these take make a lot of a lot of money and a lot of people things that india operating houses and producing houses don't have yeah um but do what you can to support small actors uh and you know only support the streaming networks that produce good things (laughs) (laughs) don't waste your money (laughs) don't have netflix sucks right now oh my god it does take it away it does we're we're gonna can't we're canceling ours because like like we never use it. We never use it. In they have me good on there. They have me through December because Bridgerton comes out in December. Yeah, uh, and Selling Sunset comes out in November. Yeah, uh, but after that, your girl's done. They haven't produced anything that I have liked since the last season of Bridgerton. It's like so rare for them to produce something that's good. I think one piece we watched on there, and then we watched the latest. But we watched the latest season of Nailed It, and we didn't like it. It was not good. So, you know. I'm going to support my favorite streamers. Thank you, Devon. Thank you. Oh, That's what you should be doing. Yeah, indie creators. That's the ultimate indie creators. Streamers on Twitch. (laughs) Speaking of indie creators, you can buy my book. No, just kidding. (laughs) No, let's do it. Let's do it. Landon, what would you... We're we're, we're, we're in. We're done. Okay, it's bleak. It's bleak, you guys. Um, Try to stay safe out there and and use your time well. Um, Landon, what would you like to plug? Uh, do it, you know what? Indie creators, go ahead and buy my book. It's uh, it's called Around the World and Back Again. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Also, you can find me on Instagram and mm-hmm. and oh, I was about to say Tumblr. Don't check out my Tumblr. Uh, <laughs> Instagram and TikTok at yeah. Land in Maine with an I. It's a it's a it's a pun. Um, I make some fun videos on there and post some fun things. Also, uh, I'm just gonna put the date November twenty second into people's heads Mm -hmm. uh yeah there might be something coming out and available on that date Mm. uh yeah i'm getting some some fun stuff back Mm -hmm. and we're really gonna go hard and 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 maybe get something published for that date (gasps) okay so so to to get you guys ready for that date that around the world and back again book that landon just mentioned you should scroll down to my about on twitch there's a link to it you should get that that's your that's your prep work that's your homework for this november um release okay that's what you need to do in this month before november 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> exactly, Rar. Exactly. I uh, wonder what shows were hit by the 07 writer strike supernatural. Oh my God, blue. True. Yes. Mm. But we also got amazing <laughs> things like uh, Dr. Singalong, Dr. Horrible Singalong blog, which I am so hoping uh, that a second sequel is in the works because of how long this writer strike has gone on. Well, you know, it happened last time. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah all right you guys we're gonna say goodbye for the the people watching on youtube we're gonna end the recording so if y'all are watching on youtube um don't forget to like comment subscribe down below and of course as always don't forget to make it a great day and don't forget to be awesome bye bye youtube bye.